Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the CPAR prevention session. Uh, this is a prevention science update. For those of you who don't know the CPAR, uh, that stands for the Center for AIDS Research, um, we were funded by the NIH to try and be of service to the greater Hopkins community, to draw new people into uh, HIV research, and to help those who may be new at HIV research to develop winning proposals. And in the, in the prevention core, there are a bunch of cores. There's an admin core, development core, clinical core, et cetera. In the prevention core, we put on programs like this one today. We have a consulting service where for NADA, we will work with you on the development of your proposals, papers, whatever. We'll give you sage advice. We're developing a prevention toolkit. And if there are particular things that you'd really like to have in the toolkit, Tamara Fliss, in the striped black and white, looks like a zebra. We'll, uh, that's our sub-Saharan Africa theme. Um, uh, send your, your notes to her. And we record all of these uh, sessions. So they will be uh, available in a few weeks on the CIFAR YouTube channel. OK, so today we are going to do a interesting approach in terms of what does it take to scale up prevention services. And we have two wonderful guests from Chapaigo. Um, I think there's some new faces in the crowd, so I would guess that there's some Chapaigo people here. That's great. We welcome you, and uh, we know how to find you, too. Um, Kelly Curran is director of the HIV AIDS and Infectious Disease Program at Chapaigo. She, I won't say how many years of experience she has, because we don't want to out a lady, uh, but she has significant experience in the field. And she's an expert in uh, male circumcision for HIV prevention and HIV counseling and testing. And she leads uh, Japigo's efforts to scale up circumcision programs in uh, southern and eastern Africa. Uh, Tiggy Adamu here is the HIV AIDS technical advisor at Japigo. Uh, he's really the, the leader of the MCHIP, the Maternal Child Health Integrated Program, which is a giant USAID. Uh, project for maternal and child health. And he has, as well, a lot of experience in male circumcision and has written lots of reports on it. Uh, so they are going to present the, the whole issue on scale up, their experience uh, in southern and eastern Africa. And then afterwards, David Peters, who's the director of the, of the uh, health system program in the Department of International Health, is going to uh, lead the discussion. And uh, if you're new to the school, uh, David is not. He's been here for a while. Uh, he's really an expert in international health systems, and he uh, looks at health, the performance of health systems. Um, he's got a zillion papers, publications, um, but he's probably very well known for the development of the sector-wide approaches, or swaps, in health. And he created the first national uh, balanced scorecard to assess and manage health services in Afghanistan. So this is going to be an interesting experience. With that, let me turn it over to our Japigo folks. And let me, I have to excuse myself. I have to teach. So I'm, I feel terrible, but I will watch the YouTube. So Kelly. Thank you so much for that introduction. It's really an honor to be here today. Um, Maybe first of all, just to begin my presentation uh, with a few words about Japigo. Um, we are an affiliate of Johns Hopkins University. I know some of you know us. Um, we, our headquarters is actually just down the street, down Broadway, uh, in Browns Wharf, in Fells Point. Japigo is turning 40 this year. Uh, we have been working um, to prevent the needless deaths of women and their families for 40 years. Um, and our um, focus is exclusively international. We don't work domestically. Uh, we are currently working in about 55 countries around the world on reproductive health and family planning, maternal and neonatal health, uh, cervical cancer prevention, HIV, TB, and malaria. Um, and we are, as I said, a, a Hopkins affiliate. Um, our CEO reports into the provost, and we collaborate closely with um, the schools of public health, medicine, and nursing. So it's really an honor to be here. Um, we are, we've been working very closely to try to strengthen our relationship with CIFAR. I've had a number of meetings with David and other colleagues. Um, I think we, there, uh, there's a lot of um, potential 
for um, implementation science research and, and cross-fertilization and collaboration between some of the work that's going on here at the School of Public Health and the work that we're doing. Um, and so it's, it's great to be here. If you have any questions, uh, our contact uh, emails are at the end of the slide set. Um, but thank you so much for your attention today. Um, the purpose of this, um, this session is really to discuss scale-up and our experience in supporting the scale-up of a very promising HIV prevention intervention in a number of countries. I'm going to do a very quick review of the evidence, but in this audience I don't think that's so necessary. And then we're going to really focus on how to take evidence to practice and then to take practice to scale. Uh, and finally, we'll pose some of the remaining questions that are facing the circumcision community these days so that we can have a discussion. Um, and I'm sure that there will be a lot of questions. Circumcision is the kind of thing that always generates a lot of discussion, a lot of questions. Um, so again, just a you know, reminder that uh, in 2000, Helen Weiss published a meta-analysis that demonstrated that circumcision is remarkably protective uh, against heterosexual HIV acquisition in both general population men and particularly actually in men at high risk. And high risk men here were defined as clients of sex workers or STI patients. Um, and of course the three clinical trials that followed that meta-analysis and they definitively proved that circumcision does reduce female to male HIV transmission by approximately 60%. Um, the Uganda uh, RCT, of course, was conducted by um, Rangre and colleagues from Hopkins uh, in Rakai, Uganda, among rural men aged 15 to 49. Um, the South Africa and Kenya clinical trials were done in slightly younger populations, 18 to 24, but um, one was in a peri-urban area, one was in an urban area. Rakai, of course, was rural. Uh, despite all of that, they came up with remarkably consistent findings um, that circumcision reduces HIV acquisition in heterosexual men by approximately 60% um, is what we say, 57% um, together. Um, maybe just a really brief reminder of the biology. Um, because we have not only, you know, observational data and epidemiological plausibility and now RCT data, but there, there are quite a number of papers demonstrating the biological basis for male circumcision as an HIV prevention strategy. Um, just kind of a reminder of the anatomy of the, the penis, but the uncircumcised penis, when it is, is flaccid, the inner foreskin, which is a very thin mucosal layer, is covered. But um, during sex, when the penis is erect, that foreskin pulls back and it exposes, I don't know, if, I don't have a pointer, but you can see the, the red inner foreskin is exposed to um, genital secretions um, that could contain HIV. Um, so, in addition to, so in addition to having a bigger surface area of exposure, we also know that the inner foreskin is, um, because it's so thin, it's subject to trauma. Um, and abrasions, microabrasions that may not even be noticeable to the man, um, which could facilitate the entry of HIV or other pathogens. And then finally, um, because it's a moist environment, it's um, often uh, colonized by anaerobic bacteria, and that inflammation that results attracts or recruits HIV target cells to the inner foreskin. So there, um, we took out all of our, our slides, our histology slides, but you can see that the, it, the foreskin actually recruits dendritic cells like Langerhans cells. So it's very easy for an HIV um, you know, viron to attach to one of those target cells. Uh, so if you remove this through circumcision, you remove you know, a huge point of entry for circumcision. And in fact, actually, the circumcised penis, it, unless it is compromised by you know, herpes lesions or some other trauma, this, the circumcised penis is actually pretty impermeable to HIV, except for the urethral meatus. Um, this is just a remind, these are data actually from Rakai. Um, following out the clinical trial um, participants, uh, of course, the trials were all closed early for ethical reasons because the incidence of new infections were so much lower in the intervention arm than the control arm. The DSMBs closed the trials, offered circumcision to all the men who had been in the control groups, but a few men actually did remain in the control group. They decided not to be circumcised, and they have been followed in Rakai and in the other two clinical trial sites now for um, about five years' time. And what you'll see is actually a strengthening of effect. You see this in the other two clinical trial sites, too. So in fact, it could be that circumcision 
uh, its protective effect may be closer to 70 or even 75 percent than the 60 percent that WHO and UNAIDS um, really uh, generally report. Um, but the kind of lesson there is I think that the further out from the circumcision, if you think about it, you know, a, a newly circumcised penis, um, if that man is sexually active, even if he's waited the six weeks advised healing time, you know, that skin is still tender, it's probably not fully keratinized, and so the longer since the healing process has taken place, he's probably more and more protected, if that makes sense. Um, so following the clinical trials, when they reported out, there was a very quick meeting convened in Stellenbosch, South Africa, by a number of leading modelers in HIV prevention to look at the potential population-based impact of um, circumcision. And the real lesson here is that um, coverage matters, scale matters. So uh, you know, at, at a 5% circumcision coverage, you will see that there is some reduction in incidence among uncircumcised men and, and women. Um, but really where you get the big protective effect is when you can achieve 50 or 70 or even 90% coverage of, of circumcision. Um, and it's important to also note that the men who are newly circumcised, while, the, while the, the prevention benefit is direct for men, women and even uncircumcised men will benefit because as HIV incidence is reduced in the community, the entire community benefits, whether you're a circumcised man, an uncircumcised man, or a woman. There's sort of a herd immunity effect, if you will, that takes place, and the higher the coverage, the sooner that will kick in and start protecting the community as a whole. So now I'd like to hand it over to Tiggy, who's going to talk a bit about the, how this research has been put into practice. Great. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me as well. And Great to see all uh, good friends here. Um, mine is going to be probably to talk about the story. I'm, I'm sure you, it's exciting to see the numbers and everything. And uh, at Jafaigo, we very much want to see, okay, this is the study. The institutions like Hopkins would come up with the study and say, okay, what's the next level? So I'll present it in a way that it is a story. How can we translate this into, uh, in the field? And most of you would remember when the study was out, I mean, the study that we presented is not to convince you, but it's just to show you how we, uh, we moved. But after the studies were out, and everybody was convinced that we should do this, WHO in early 2007 came up with a recommendation that male circumcision can be used as one of the interventions for the prevention of HIV. And as it's always the case with WHO, WHO com comes up with a, a package of how to bring this research into a service delivery. And that's where as JAPAIGO, we very much want to be with JAPAIGO and make sure that that is translated into something that happens in a clinic. Uh, something that goes from paper to actual service delivery. And in that early stage, JAPAIGO was there to basically change the research findings and some of the experience from public health and surgery into a training package. The first generic training package, uh, I'm honored to say like JAPAIGO, in collaboration with WHO and UNAIDS, basically translated that into a training package so that countries started to use it as a pilot uh, training material and for their uh, pilot project. And a number of activities happened after the 2007. Lots of guidance documents in terms of safety. What are the quality improvement uh, perspectives? What are uh, the ways of assessing the situation of countries where circumcision is not a practice? How, how about countries where circumcision is still a practice but it is done in a traditional setting as opposed to a medical setting. So understanding all that dynamics in those countries was very important. And we wanted to help the public health environment by making sure that what is being practiced at the field level and what is being given as a scientific evidence work together hand in hand. So working with WHO, one of the things that people I, I, at least uh, to focus was to make sure that we have uh, a clearly outlined geographic focus. And WHO and its recommendations say that this is not going to be like the, the solution, but part of the HIV prevention. And it might work better if we basically focus it in countries where HIV, adult HIV prevalence is very high, and at the same time, uh, where male circumcision prevalence is very low. Actually, there was a slide which, which showed like in those countries where HIV prevalence was very high, the circumcision 
prevalence was mainly less than 20 percent, very abysmal. In countries where HIV prevalence, for one reason or another, is very low, like Ethiopia, where I'm from, the circumcision prevalence already is very high, as high as 94 percent. So that was a very good starting point to actually advocate the science to implementation. And WHO used that. And WHO packaged the male circumcision into, uh, into two major components. One is the, in, the initial implementation phase, where there's a lot of preparation in terms of uh, advocacy, in terms of getting leadership buy-in, and in terms of creating an enabling environment. And those things were translated in the form of situational analysis toolkits, program guidance documents, and quality assurance tools. And then the next phase of WHO's effort was, OK, if you have these documents, how do you do it in a facility level? And that's where I'll be talking about JAPAIGO's role in, in some of those areas. And as you also, I'm sure, know, we, even with the best intentions of having the right policies, the right documents and everything, you may not really have the results that can really correlate with what you put as an input. And this is not just like to start by a bad news here, but when WHO, after implementation of all those initial preparatory phase, did a policy analysis using uh, the framework, the diffusion of innovation framework, as well as the expand need, trying to see which countries are early adopters when it comes to male circumcision, which countries are really ready to take on male circumcision as an intervention and go faster. And the result has been mixed. There were countries like Kenya that really adopted most of the recommendations by WHO and had lots of what you can call an indicator for a success in the program, they did very well. But there are also other countries who even did most of those things faster than Kenya, but it didn't happen. But the message we took from that is, like we cannot really focus on a particular way of implementing a program, but we can see that and make sure that we use it for a particular context. If it works in Kenya, maybe we can capitalize that leadership in Kenya. And that's what we've tried uh, at Japai Group to focus on things that work in a particular context. And the other thing that WHO recommended as part of the initial implementation package was the communication. And WHO elegantly came up with all the different uh, models to come up with alternatives of how to communicate, what contents to create, how to segment your audience when you approach for male circumcision in many different countries. And we try to follow that uh, closely and in some countries, this is an example from uh, Tanzania, where we try to do a little bit of like a detailed analysis of our, uh, our audience, try to segment our audience, try to select our uh, media. And we managed to reach as many young men as possible to offer the services. And in some instances, in some parts of Tanzania, for example, it was challenging to get the, the, the clients. In those cases, we were very proactive, as opposed to waiting, for example, two years of implementation and then saying, oh, the clients are not coming. We tried to be very active in understanding why are we having not, uh, why are clients not coming to our clinic today, so that we can make changes next week, not next year. And we tried to discuss that with young men and young women, and men and their partners in the community, to understand, and it paid off. In some of the clinics in Tanzania, when we opened our clinics, we had overwhelming demand because of those recommendations that from, we got from WHO. But that, the case is not the same everywhere. In some places, we put a lot of intervention and input to communication. This is an example in Swaziland, where I was there to start my circumcision program for about 10 months. We had a huge input. Healthcare workers were there. Communication strategies were excellent. We communicated everything, and, but you see that I am sitting with the healthcare providers waiting for clients, and we had none this particular day. We had none. So the message I'm trying to communicate here is like, there are so many things that we have to play around when we are implementing this thing. It sometimes comes as uh, more of as an art than a science. So we try to learn from all these challenges that we had in front of us. Then. This is like getting the buy-in. And the second one was the actual, okay, the doing part. The getting the healthcare workers to be motivated, getting the healthcare workers to actually uh, provide the second season. Can you probably move on to this one, right? Yeah. 
Thanks, Jaggi. So the next um, phase of implementation is really focusing on human resource development, so making sure that there are enough providers and counselors available to support the scale-up phase. Um, quality assurance and improvements, it's relatively easy to ensure quality at the beginning, at the pilot phase, when there's just a few sites, but how do you ensure quality when you have dozens or even hundreds of service delivery points? The supply chain um, becomes very important at this point. Um, and forecasting that can be a challenge and ensuring that all of the service delivery points have what they need to meet the needs of the client. Uh, monitoring evaluation and operations research, of course. Um, so Japaigo has been very involved in the human resource uh, phase. Um, in addition to the training and the training package, male circumcision under local anesthesia, which is the surgical manual that Tiggy mentioned, um, we've had the privilege of training um, both the surgical providers, the doctors, clinical officers, and nurses who are doing the uh, service provision, as well as the counselors and the community mobilizers who also play an, an important role both on the demand generation side and on the counseling side. Um, probably we should have mentioned in more detail at the beginning, but male circumcision for HIV prevention is offered as a package of services. It's not just a standalone surgery, so all clients receive a group education session and then an individual counseling session. The individual counseling session emphasizes risk reduction counseling. It includes the offer of an HIV test for that man and his partner if she's present with him. Um, the condoms are promoted and provided to clients at that time and then men are screened for STIs and any STIs are screened before um, the circumcision is provided. So it's really a kind of comprehensive package of prevention services for men. Um, we have uh, been able to uh, train healthcare workers in um, 13 of the of the 14 priority countries for the scale up, um, and um, have been also quite involved in task shifting. So in supporting those countries that have elected to make nurses or clinical officers their frontline um, provider for adult male circumcision. Um, just briefly, you know, quality assurance. I wanted just for everyone to be aware of the malecircumcision.org uh, website. This is a clearinghouse that's run by the World Health Organization, and all of the documents that we've mentioned today are available at the clearinghouse. But there are quality assurance tools available there. Um, and then JAPAIGO has taken those tools and um, used our, our standards-based management and recognition approach to kind of operationalize the use of those tools um, at, the, at the site level to make sure that quality is maintained. Um, supplies and commodities, um, it's not always the most interesting part of the scale of scale up to think about you know, supply chain and commodity management, but it's really critical. Um, and we're talking about doing millions and millions of procedures. That's a lot of suture materials, a lot of forceps, a lot of test kits um, that need to be you know, at the right place, at the right time, not expired, sterile. Um, so it's, it's a huge challenge. Um, at the beginning of the scale-up, many programs were using reusable instrument sets, which are now increasingly bundled. There also uh, has been developed a single-use, fully disposable kit that is uh, now made by several manufacturers, and, and PEPFAR has been supporting the procurement of that single-use kit. You see the boxes um, in a number of countries, uh, sort of a circumcision in a box. Um, and then I would just sort of say, you know, data, at this phase of the scale-up, data becomes very important um, for guiding decisions as you move forward. Um, and just to give a couple of examples of how we have supported ministries of health to gather data on their circumcision programs. In Tanzania, um, there is an electronic data management system um, that is, uh, presently it's actually housed at uh, the Japago offices in Dar es Salaam, but it's going to be transferred, it's in the process of being transferred to the Ministry of Health and Social Work. All partners supporting male circumcision in Tanzania use that same database. Um, and then in Mozambique, they actually are pretty high tech. They're using tablets at each of their um, sites to gather direct client level data as the client comes in. Um, and those data then can be uh, you know, aggregated, reported at the end of the day, and these are used on a daily basis to help guide demand generation activities. Um, so if you have some sites which are overwhelmed with demand, you can, you can make sure to sort of turn off the demand generation activities that are feeding into those sites. If you have other sites that are under capacity, you can reroute community mobilizers to serve those sites. So moving on now, it's from practice to scale up. Yeah, this is yeah how we do it at Japan, go back and forth. 
but for the interest of time, I'll, I'll probably go faster from this point so that we can have a discussion in the end. Uh, but the discussion of scale up uh, becomes very important when we talk about male circumcision. Uh, and you've seen this, uh, this figure, Japago works in almost all of those uh, southern and eastern African countries except for Namibia, Uganda, and Zimbabwe uh, in scaling up the program. But one of the things that was done in, uh, under the leadership of UNAIDS was coming up with a target to have the maximum public health impact of male circumcision, what we needed to do. And UNAIDS, WHO, using the DMPBT model, the decision makers uh, uh, program planning tool, came up with this number. And that somehow locked us into what uh, seems to be like the number that we hear from everyone implementing male circumcision, 20.3 million circumcision in five years. Uh, a daunting task, but it has been, it was supposed to be aspirational, but it has become something like a nightmare for most of us uh, on male circumcision. And the idea is to, to make sure that we circumcise adult men in the age group between 15 and 49 in the, in the five years, uh, followed by probably that tail extended, uh, extended time where some of the adolescents become adults. That would be an additional 8 million that we, that we haven't seen in the 20 million, plus starting neonatal or early infant circumcision as early as possible so that we can take over the, the role of MC in the long run. Uh, and again, this has become a very strong advocacy tool because if you scale up to that extent with that timing, this is the amount of infec infections that, that can be averted in, by 2025. And this number is so huge, especially in places in Southern Africa where HIV is still the major topic, where everybody really cries about HIV. If you have an intervention that can really bring about this kind of change, it's huge. And this was used as an advocacy tool actually in many, in many places. Uh, and again, the other uh, argument about scale up. So if we can do this kind of scale up in the next five years, it might cost us now, but the cost saving sometime down the line is going to be huge. Basically making sure that we can uh, have some saving by doing something right now and uh, quickly. But, while that is a very good number and a very good exercise, in terms of achievement, when you look at it, by 2011, <coughs> except for Kenya, and in Kenya we're focusing on a particular province, Nyanza, ex except for Kenya, most of the countries were still struggling in that phase of takeoff for circumcision. So it's really challenging. Most countries find it very difficult to see the future of meeting 80% of target by 20, 2016. And that's where people who are really interested in scale up become concerned. What can we do to make sure this actually takes off? Whenever you talk about resources, our good friends at FR always talk about resources not going to be an issue. You need to come up with a strategy to get to that 80%. So that's what the figure that they will show you. That is the resource. It goes, it goes out at the ceiling. But you look at the productivity so far. Again, this is the number from only like PFR supporter sites, additional other donors are also providing uh, funding for circumcision, but we're around 2, 2.1 million so far, vis-a-vis -vis the 20 million that I told you. So if you see, we are like 3% in 2010, and we've moved uh, a lot, 10%, 10 and this is huge if you see it, if you see how it takes to circumcise one young man in many of the places in Africa, it will be very far from a clinic. But when you look at the number and the modeling, it's a little depressing, but it is not as depressing as it looks. Then this is like Japago's contribution. Maybe I, I'll go ahead and. So from the 20 million, and I, I told you Japago, except for three countries, is uh, providing services in many, uh, in many of the countries. But I, we chose the, what we call the four big countries, just because we, we have uh, enough number of circumstances in these four countries, Mozambique, Tanzania, and Kenya, Kenya and Zambia. We circumcised close to 380,000 men in, in the last uh, four years, in the last four years. And this represents between like 20, 15 to 20% of the global male circumcision target. And if you add the additional countries outside the four countries, it gets to half a million, which is 25% of the global target. So we've been an active part of this male circumcision scale up in Southern and Eastern Africa. And 
we, we try to make sure that the quality improvement that we talked about that is recommended by WHO is maintained. That is somehow translated in the adverse event risk that we see in many of, in all of the countries. It ranges between 0 0.3, to, uh, 0 0.3 and 0.4 percent, which is uh, a very good uh, rate for adverse event. WHO expects you to have a maximum of 2 percent adverse event rate. In terms of our client profile, in terms of age, most of the most of our clients, you don't see the uh, the white part. Uh, it, it doesn't show. It's unfortunately it's white. But for those young men who are above the age of 24, the number we're getting is very limited. Unfortunately, you can you can't see it here. Uh, but that's where one of the challenges that we're having in our program. Most of the clients that are coming to our clinic are less than 24 uh, years of age. Even though our modeling is somehow uh, designed for 15 to 49, most of the clients that are coming are around the age of 15, that is 10 to 24. And that has some, probably something that we can discuss at the end of our presentation. So what it meant was we needed to think about how to move fast and how to scale. And in consultation with WHO, probably some of you have probably been involved in this, there was one area that we thought can be uh, exploited, that is improving the efficiency of services when it comes to attending. Uh, and that was, uh, that was written in a WHO document called Models for Optimized Volume and Efficiency that recommends uh, efficient use of human resource and increasing productivity per person or per individual and also improving access to community members. So what we did was in some of the countries, Circumcision is always seen as a procedure that needs to be done by only doctors, surgeons, or urologists. So we had to really work with the ministries of health and professional associations to say, like, it's okay, it is safe to have competent nurses, competent midwives actually doing the procedure. And this is a case from Mozambique, where we've seen no difference, at least in one safety indicator, that's adverse events between nurses and surgeons or doctors. So that was one case that we made in Mozambique. Now, most of the circumcisions that are done in Mozambique are done by non-physician clinicians, which is a huge success as far as I'm concerned. The other thing was the surgical procedure. Men's circumcision, you can do it in different ways, but when you are trying to do it in a, as a public health intervention, you might want to choose something that is simple because that is easy and scalable. So we tried to look at the different methods of circumcision and identified a forceps guided circumcision, which is easier and simpler to teach and simpler to actually perform the procedure as opposed to the others. And that also helped in improving the number of circumcisions that we do in a particular facility. And also the way circumcision is done, at least uh, what I know in Ethiopia is, you start your day at around 10, you start uh, having preparation and the paperwork and everything. By the time you finish one circumcision, it's already afternoon. And if you are doing it as a public health intervention, you cannot, you're not going to do it like that. So one of the things we tried to do was, if we can have multiple beds temporarily in some of the facility, maybe we can get to the number as quickly as we can. And in some places we adopted a way of that, something that you know. And the other issue we had was the actual access. Circumcision still was done in healthcare facilities, but many of our community members, young men and their families live very far. So one of the things we tried to do was move with our clinic staff closer to the community by having tents and doing procedure in tents, and sometimes even closer at the backyard. This is a circumcision being done at the backyard of one of our clients who had about how many kids? 40 kids. And we, and he's, he's in Tanzania, lots of kids. So at, in his backyard, we had to set up our small mobile clinic to circumcise. So that's one of the things that we did to make sure we get the number. And at the same time, try to actively assist barriers and facilitators and make sure that those are incorporated in our programs on a weekly, on a monthly basis. So we are very proactive. We try to engage healthcare workers to think that way so that have solutions the next week, not next year. And modify our communication strategy because the demand, the supply side is pretty much taken care of. Like uh, I think most of my colleagues at MC, uh, Mr. Kamsin are talking about, because the program is somehow managed and made and discussed by doctors and clinicians and nurses, the supply side was somehow well taken care of. We had really uh, all the package that you need for circumcision. 
but the demand side was a challenge. So we had to invest a lot on the demand side. And when we talk about, again, providing services in large scale, the issue was the supply that Kelly talked about. The usable instrument, in most of the clinics, you probably have five or six usable instruments. You need to wait for this instrument to be reprocessed. Automatically, it may not be working. You have to send it to a different clinic to be processed. So one of the things that, that happened was, under the leadership of USAID, different partners under PEFAR came together to come up with a, with a medical circumcision kit that is easy to procure, easy to distribute, and it's a one-time use, and we can get the benefit of economy of scale in this one. And of course, uh, I'm sure Professor Peters also agrees with me, is this continuous engagement of leaders, especially in an intervention like this, uh, is very important, and we continue to engage leaders in many events. This is uh, what happened I IAS, International AIDS Conference in Washington DC last time, where we had the former president of Tanzania to come and talk about male circumcision so that we engage the community to work, to work with us in here. This slide, I wanted to show you this slide because, because of those simple efficiency measures that I talked about, multiple phase, changing the surgical procedure and everything, you can actually see a change within a month. So if you can do this in large scale, you can imagine the kind of scale up that you would achieve. This is just in one clinic, uh, in, in one region in Tanzania. But if we can make sure that we understand the context and make sure that we have solution in, that fits to that context, then we can have this kind of change in terms of output in terms of circumcision. And I think this is the last slide for discussion. We're still struggling with a number of uh, questions that we have in, in that circumcision. One is, since we have a lot of clients out there, and the challenge is we're not really getting there. We don't have enough human resources. One of the, the innovation is the bringing device into the picture of real circumcision. We all know we are still in that process of trying to study uh, the, the role of device in male circumcision, but will this help us in getting to that 20 million as pushing on target? And also, how are we going to get these older clients? We've tried in Tanzania, we've tried day and night what to do, how to communicate and get these older clients, but it has been very challenging. Maybe, uh, again, discussion in this room. So looking at all what we've done, we've tried our best and I think we're doing, we're doing very well. But in terms of the future, it's becoming very challenging. So this is an opportunity for us probably to discuss our data system. I think with that, we'll end our presentation. Great, thanks. Thanks very much. It's a very impressive story. I'm trying to see if I can get that to work. There we go. So I was asked to, to speak for a few minutes about uh, how this relates to other, other ideas of what we know about scaling up programs. So I thought I'd spend a few minutes talking about that before opening up to discussion. But I have to say my, my initial reaction is that this is a very impressive story. When you think about over the course of four years moving up to a, a program that wasn't doing a lot of circumcisions, medical circumcisions to two million or half a million with Trapago is, is truly a, an impressive success story, regardless of whatever target you set for it. So I think that has to be looked at in that context. Um, no, that doesn't work, but let's try this one. So one of the things I wanted to uh, raise is just sort of looking at the question of uh, how do you actually frame this question? of uh, is this a question of scaling up a service or is it really around looking at expanding access to service? And this is a framework that we use for understanding access to service. So the first thing you start about look at is, is looking at the, the center of what is your health condition? So you could look at this as a question of, well, you have redundant foreskin and therefore you have to get rid of it. Uh, or if you think of it more broadly in terms of HIV prevention and uh, or trying to reduce risks, of, um, it's, a, it's a much more complicated or uh, a bigger issue really about how do you link this with a whole cascade of prevention and treatment services that have to happen time and time again. The other thing I would point out is, is if you look at it really from the uh, uh, access, you have to think of different dimensions, not just the quality of the service, which clearly you're paying attention, but also different parts of availability, accessibility, acceptability, uh, and financial costs, most, which at this point are largely taken care of by external project funding. 
The, the, I think the thing that's impressive is that uh, for each of these dimensions, there's both a supply side as well as a demand side. And that is something that when you look at the experience of most programs in terms of scaling up services, they've really started off focusing on the supply side and then really started paying attention when that curve starts settling down, that you can't reach more people. And then, oh, well, we have to figure out how we can we reach these people and looking at demand. And I think that what's, what's instructive from the story that you told is that you've really started looking at the demand side early on. Yes, a big emphasis on supply, you have to have the the trained people, the surgery uh, suites, and, and everything ready to go. But looking early on at the demand, and really at all aspects of, of availability, and that's, that's very helpful. Um, we also have to think of, well, what does it really mean to scale up? Because uh, there's different ways of looking at, at how this occurs. And very often, you will find that what PEPFAR or other funders think is very different from the experience of people on the ground. And there has been a lot of writing uh, about this recently, thinking of what is scaling up. Uh, largely, it is a, is a process of expanding coverage of health interventions. But really, this has very different meanings. And it's not actually a very new concept. Uh, we do think of it, it becoming large, more services, more people, more places. Or very often, you hear in the donor community about donor absorption of aid. You know, can, you, can you absorb the money? Can you use the money to spend it? Uh, but really, there's a much bigger tradition uh, that comes that looks at how do you expand, and there, there there is a reason for that, and that is because no matter how standardized your service or what your outcome target is, uh, the way in which countries get there, the way in which regions get there, is very different. What this pickup stick drawing is is a picture of skilled birth attendance coverage. Uh, this is the MDG picture, pictures because this is one of the service targets for the Millennium Development Goals. The target is now 90% because the goalposts were moved from 80% a few years ago. And each line represents sort of the linear trend of country changes in reaching skilled birth attendance. And this is the average trend uh, of which you'll see there's no country that really follows an average. And that where you start off matters a great deal, and that, in fact, the, the slopes of countries are very different. So countries follow a different pathway no matter, what, uh, you know, no matter what target you send. And that is very instructive in terms of how do you scale up. Now, you could be saying that we should be paying attention to these negative slopes or these ones at the bottom. And the ones up top are the things you don't really have to worry about. Uh, but it does mean that you have to think about implementation of how things work. Maybe that's obvious. But I think from this old Pete Seeger song, you have to think, when will we ever learn? When will we ever learn? Because uh, what's happened with the Millennium Development Goals and all the services related to that is some very conventional thinking that is very much a cookie cutter approach. So the conventional pathway, and I'm not talking about what you're doing, I'm talking about you know, the, what's been happening particularly since the MDGs. You start off with a cost effective intervention and you have a good one, male circumcision. Uh, you then set ambitious targets, 20 million foreskins, um, fund them adequately, funding is no problem, and then you just implement as you've designed them. And this is, again, where you expect things to break down because it, life doesn't work that way. Now, we have looked at, at previous models. As I said, thinking of scaling up is not a particularly new notion. Here are six different frameworks for scaling up, and you mentioned two of them, Diffusion of Innovation and, and Expand Nets. And you can, you can sort of lump them into, two, into different groups. So one of them is sort of the recent effort to try and really expand coverage as soon as you can, as quickly as it can in the short term, where you know, you're going to overcome things by throwing a lot of money at it and disperse the money, and you should be able to, to implement. Well, what, really what we know from the history of, of scaling up uh, either scaling up innovations or pilot projects, which is sort of the, the background to those different models, is that you, it's, not, it's really more important about expanding impact. And you need to think of, of uh, scaling up not only in terms of coverage, but also in terms of functional ability, your organization's ability to do more things, your ability to maintain and get that political commitment, both not just at the top levels, but at bottom levels, and be able to expand your financing types of base, as opposed to something that you hope you can do in a short term with external funding. So obviously, that takes on a different scale in terms of time. Uh, money is not necessarily the important thing. And often, absorptive capacity is dealt with very differently. You're trying to find a, bit, a fit between what beneficiaries want and need and what you can deliver, both in terms of the programs and the organizations. And 
these aspects of how do you learn, adapt, uh, and change as you move along become much more important than just simply getting the money out and delivering the services. So what are the factors that influence scaling up? Uh, well, these are things that are known, the strategy itself, um, how do you learn from experience, uh, the replication model. Now, the, the, the notion that uh, the adoption of a policy by a country will lead to rapid uh, implementation, I think, from your slide shows it doesn't really work. You know, the diffusion of innovations really is much more important on the demand side in many cases. You know, once everybody wants to be circumcised, then I think maybe we'll have a, a better chance. Doesn't matter what the policy, well, it matters what the policymakers say, but it's not enough. They can certainly block things, and that's maybe part of the story in Uganda, certainly. Uh, and then these other aspects, I think, are also known to uh, affect scaling up. Uh, from the practical lessons, again, looking over those different models and experience, the focus and quantitative coverage provides little insight on the actions needed both for, for growth as well as sustainability. So this notion that you have to have 20 million circumcisions that's become the bane of your existence is really in line with that. You really need to think beyond that. Again, this bias towards supply side, I think that you've overcome a lot of that in your program by focusing on demand, particularly for uh, you know, your eventual success. And, uh, and then paying attention to political organization, all of these other aspects, and nurturing lo local organizations, something we didn't really hear about. I mean, a lot of training and quality improvement processes, but I guess the, you know, some big questions that might be raised are what's supposed to happen when the project money ends and who's going to continue to do that. But maybe at that time, it's not so much uh, adult male circumcision. Hopefully, it'll be more at the, at the neonatal end. I was going to talk about this as a complex adaptive system, but in the interest of time and moving on, let me just move on to say that, that there are some implications of this uh, and that I think that some of the lessons from, from uh, understanding systems uh, have, are, are relevant to both what you're doing and where you go forward with, with scaling up. And that really you need flexible policy and planning. You need to get intelligence. You need constant information about the key players, whether it's those that are affecting your, your older men uh, or those that, you know, whatever is keeping people out of the clinics or doing something else and understanding the context. Why Swaziland is not like Tanzania, uh, those kinds of issues. Uh, trying to identify the different kinds of factors that promote diffusion and dissemination. Variability that you've described is very much expected and you need to be able to not just uh, detect it but then take advantage of that in terms of what, what's to be done, unintended consequences. And I think uh, that really what this boils down to in terms of what you can do about it is linking your monitoring evaluation with implementation through frequent cycles of adaptation experimenting and, and adaptation through a very uh, collaborative approach. So that's I think that the kind of lessons that are, are learned from more broadly about scaling up whether it's you know immunizations, whether it's ORS family planning, I think that there's a lot of lessons that you've taken from that already in your approach. Uh, but also portend for huge challenges ahead. So with that, I just wanted to uh, then maybe turn it over and open it up for, for further discussion. So, So in terms of, or do you guys want to come up to the front here because there's a mic here. So if you come up, you can talk and we'll take, uh, we'll take questions here. And Maria has the first question already. Mm -hmm. The 
would escape that is by the same right they are at high level. I would imagine that they would escape that. Uh, but it's so otherwise the invisible uh, work mm -hmm. is not going to be important. Oh, and by the way, this is really interesting. I'd rather have this type of varieties, this, this type of study in the system than those varieties that the field is using as a field. They were investing in the field of the field of the with all the market conditions that they had. Mm -hmm. And they update this at this point because they need to get better at that point. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you want to, let, you want to yeah. respond to that? Or? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, while you were really raising the issue, I was actually thinking of like the, the opportunities we will have in the next uh, months or so on how to really communicate this message. Because we do feel the same way in terms of this targeting. It has really taken over our focus. And it has actually affected some of our programs. Mm -hmm. uh, because people are... Exactly. So when it works, it actually works because in some of our clinics, actually people, what people do is they go out to the clinic, see a number of young men outside, and they tell them like, like one, two, three, four, five. By doing five of you, I'm averting one HIV infection. And people say, ah, that, it works in those situations. But in some other situations, that number is going to be an obstacle. So our role is to continue to have that advocacy, engage the different donors and implementing partners to, to bring them to uh, that, kind of, that kind of reality at some point. Um, and if I could maybe just add, I know I, you know colleagues who are on the male circumcision technical working group at PEPFAR are, uh, this year is a big focus for them on sort of rebranding the discussion that we have around this target. I mean, I think the aspirational target has been great. The modeling has been fabulous for resource allocation. You know, we have a lot of resources now. Um, but I think there is a big effort to engage with the OGAC public affairs team to try to sell, you know, two million circumcisions in, you know, low resource settings is a success and that should be celebrated. And it's not, every, you know, every one of those circumcisions represents, you know, a client who came in, who was counseled, who was tested, who got condoms, who got circumcised. I mean, every, you know, every individual is a success story in and of itself and two million is really nothing to discount. It's it's actually an incredible success and it only looks like a poor achievement. I mean, two million was our target for the ARV scale up. You know, if you think about it, for the whole of PEPFAR 1, that was the target, was two million. So there's, there, I think this year they're going to really focus on kind of rebranding the discussion and trying to, to help uh, everybody feel more comfortable. But I agree, it's, it's, it's a challenge. And I think um, one of the things that you are finding about the high-risk communities, and, and you know, we also serve you know, fishing. We're working in Malawi now, and we have all the same issues of the fishermen in Lake Malawi. And I think there is more openness to experimenting um, with uh, reimbursement for lost wages and reimbursement for transport. And I think that those things may um, be the key to success with some of these older male populations. Um, and then finally, I would just say that I, I personally, if we can achieve 80% coverage in men up to age 24 or up to age 29, for me, that will be a success. You know, I'm not wed to the idea of circumcising every last 47-year-old. You know, I really don't think that that is very realistic. But if we can get to 80% coverage in adolescents and young men, I think that we will be sending a generation of men into their highest risk years protected and and I will feel fine with that. <laughs> so. so David and then up here. Oh. Mm 
Yeah, maybe I don't know. In the, on the, the second the second part where supply has been a challenge, we had the opportunity at some point to work with the government of Namibia, where the demand still is high, but the supply because of the limited human resource they have was a challenge. And most services are provided through a private private sector. So one of the things that we try to work with with a, again with the USC, USAID's private sector project shops was to make sure that Mercer Campson is included as one of the reimbursable uh, interventions in a private clinic. So you can go to a private clinic and get uh, circumcision. That wasn't the case. We had to really work with the Ministry of Health and the private providers to get into private practice. And we are also working with the private sector on how to provide male circumcision as a public health intervention because it's different. When you do circumcision in a private clinic using general anesthesia, it, you can get more money, but it is not safe. So that kind of negotiation is something that we are trying to have with the private sector providers and also in other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are some efforts that are going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, maybe one more word about the private sector. We're actually just about ready to start a study in Tanzania looking at our hypothesis is that actually the demand has been increased among adult men, you know, or older men sort of in their late 20s and up in Tanzania, but that the barriers to being circumcised in the public sector are too great. There's, we've done a lot of formative um, research. We have a paper coming out um, next month, actually, in the Global Health Science and Practice about this. But we believe that some old, older men might be being served in the private sector. So we're going to do a study just to try to document what's going on. Because none of you know the numbers that Tiggy presented, the private sector is really not being captured at all in terms of, this is actually probably an underestimate you know, of the number of circumcisions that have been done since 2009. Um, so that's one thing. In terms of the reimbursements or the, you know, cash transfers, yes, the concerns have been ethical in nature. I think there have been, um, you know, the primary donor for this intervention is uh, PEPFAR. The secondary donor is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I think they've both been really sensitive to that, you know, um, a perception of coercion. Um, and so there have been very strict sort of limitations on what implementing partners can do. But as we've really run up into this problem of, of, of not being able to serve older men, and a lot of men do report, you know, if they're day laborers, um, whether they're fishermen or whether they're driving a motorcycle taxi or whatever, they will report that it is a barrier to them. You know, three days off work is a barrier that is insurmountable. And so I think the donors have much more openness. If you can document that, you know, um, lost wages or transport costs are a barrier, you can get sort of permission to experiment with these um, schemes um, in a very controlled manner. Um, but this is a, you know, there, there's a whole, we haven't, you know, there's a big, as I'm, you know, Ron, Ron and Maria, I'm sure get all the emails from these people, there's a big organized anti-circumcision lobby and movement out there, and I think we're trying very hard not to run afoul of them. So we have, a, I think we have a few hands here, so why don't we take the few questions and then uh, and then we'll go around. So what was we'll go around is sort of here, there, there, and end up with Ron, or was there one more hand back there? We'll take the next four questions and then go from there. Okay, so why don't you go first? My name is Jamie, I'm an undergraduate nursing student, and um, I'm curious what your approach has been in terms of um, improving the student of young men who are testing as well as the education, and I'm also just curious what the outreach is probably going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Must be it. There's it. You should you should be happy that you want the partner. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
So, Charlie, you have a number of questions mm -hmm. and comments to respond to, from uh, charges to what happened in Seattle Street to mm -hmm. the sex difference. Okay. Do you want to go first? Yeah. I, yeah. I can go to uh, mm -hmm. about Swazi because I, I was there for, and we should have probably had you in, in Swazi now. But I don't really want to hype, like, give you a hypothetical reason. Mm -hmm. But we had, we're still working on an evaluation of what has happened. And a number of things did happen. Uh, important of all was the, I think, the target and the duration that we set for ourselves from the very from the outset was a challenge. And unfortunately, most most of us in the program in Swaziland, including from from the government and those who went there to support the healthcare workers, even community members had that reservation from the very beginning, but everybody wanted to try it. Uh, then in the process, lots of things I think went mm -hmm. astray and mm -hmm. hopefully we'll have some complete report of what happened and what we learned from Swaziland. But it has been a very good exercise in terms of understanding what not to do mm -hmm. in, in other programs, yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe just so, for, since Swaziland is, uh, is, in Swaziland, PEPFAR made a very, um, huge commitment to trying to support the government of the Kingdom of Swaziland to compress their scale-up. They had had a five-year scale-up strategy. And so the modeling, we didn't show the Swazi-specific modeling because we didn't have time, but there was modeling done. You know, again, it's like, you know, a little modeling can be a dangerous thing, um, which showed that if you compress the scale-up into a one-year scale-up from a five-year scale-up, you could, you know, bend the epidemic curve sooner and faster. And it, you know, the Swaziland is a setting where, you know, 43% of pregnant women are HIV positive. It truly is an emergency situation. And so I understand why that was tried, you know, that was tried. But essentially, if anyone has ever worked in Swaziland, you know, things don't move quickly in, a, in that place. And trying to do 135,000 circumcisions in 10 months just proved unfeasible. And because the time frame of the project was so short, you were kind of locked in once you started. And there wasn't any room 
to really do much mid-course correction other than just shutting down some sites. But even that, you know, and you know, you're ending up paying people three months of severance for staff who are hired up. And so I, I think, but you know, and I think there were probably a lot of issues with the um, with the demand generation to, you know, the partners that were involved. But overall, I just think, uh, you know, a lesson that I've learned, I think that's really relevant for the demand side is that settings where you are catching up minority communities to a national norm, there is a lot of latent demand and it's relatively easy. Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, you know, more than 50% of men are already circumcised. There's a baseline of desire for circumcision. Everybody knows that if they move to the capital city, they will never have sex unless they're circumcised. I mean, that's worth 100 million, you know, free radio ads, basically. But in a setting like Swaziland, where nobody was circumcised, nobody had been circumcised for 200 years, you had to create a new norm from the beginning, and that can't be done in 10 months. Um, so maybe the question about cost, just quickly. So the donors are subsidizing the service. So nobody is paying, unless it, men who are going in the private sector would pay. But in the public sector and in the NGO sector, all of these services are free to the clients right now. Um, what else? Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, the form, the paper, you know, we'll try to make sure that everybody's aware of our paper from Tanzania that's coming out shortly, it did definitely find a number of issues, not just for the men themselves being concerned about having to abstain for six weeks, but actually many men are very concerned about what their partners will be doing during the six weeks of abstinence. And we found that, you know, in focus groups with women, they would say, you know, it takes three stones to hold up your cooking pot. So if one of your stones is off, you can just have the other, you know, the three stones being your husband, the man you have sex with for fun, and the man you have sex with for resources. So you always have one is recovering from circumcision, the other two are always available. And so, the, you know, showing that maybe the men, some of their concerns were maybe founded um, in terms of, you know, there's a lot of really complex, I think, you know, cir introducing circumcision into a marriage is kind of like introducing condoms into a marriage. There has to be a discussion. It's not like his partner is not going to notice. You know, she has to agree. And, you know, she may wonder, well, why do you need this? Why are you doing this? I think, you know, it's really hard to serve those older men. You know, part, it's, again, the teenagers, the infants, it's just, it's a blank slate. It's so much easier. Many of our adolescents are pre-sexual, as you said, so it's not a big deal for them to abstain for six weeks. Um, Great. Yeah. And with that, I think we can, we can go to the break. So I, I think this, there's a lot more room for discussion, and then we'll have the, uh, the, the cookies and drinks to do that. So I'll turn over to you tomorrow. And, but before doing that, I just want to thank, uh, thank you for coming in the great presentation. Thank you.